Okay, hey guys, good afternoon. Welcome back to class. We still have about four minutes, then we'll get the meeting going. Um, but welcome back, and good to see you guys. Just hang in there for a few moments. Hi, Margarito, good to see you. Chelsea, Hannah, how's it going? Just hanging out with Peach here. Hi, Yvonne. Hey, Brenda, Nick, you guys are doing well. Hey, Stacy, Edward, Vanessa, welcome back. Hey there, Nancy, <clears throat> and all the rest. Hope you've had a good few days since Monday. Um, calendar just keeps moving along. It's a little bit of rain today where I'm at. I don't know if, uh, about you, but I'm in Long Beach. Got some little showers and actual thunderstorm this morning. But the sun seems like it's starting to poke through a little bit, so that's nice. Hey, Danny, Danny, Nayeli, Jennifer. <clears throat> okay. Ray, Sunny, welcome back. <clears throat> I can't believe it. Hello, everyone there. Amanda, Alexa, Noah, Avani. Good to see you guys. And we're just about ready to get started. <clears throat> Let me get myself a little soft drink. I'll be right back. Okay. Well guys, welcome back, it's one o'clock, so let's get things started. Thanks so much again for being here. And um, let's just kind of pick up where we left off. So a few points just to keep in mind. In a week from today, that's next uh, Wednesday, the 10th, we're gonna have our midterm exam. And so the main things that we're doing before then, today we're gonna finish up our notes on chapter four, and then I'll send the study guide for the midterm review session over the weekend so you can start looking at it and getting your thoughts collected. And then um, we'll have a review session on Tuesday where we're just going to go over all the content from the class and take another hard look at it to make sure we're ready. And then you'll have your exam next Wednesday. So that's the plan. Today, lecture on Chapter 4, get through as much of it as we can. Over the weekend, you'll receive the study guide. Monday, we'll do a review session. And then Wednesday next week, we will have the, uh, the exam, the midterm. Um, I've graded the first homework and the first quiz. Many people have uh, sent me a request for their grade, and so I've been able to reply to all the emails that I received and give comments for those assignments. Anybody who's still looking for any scores, just feel free to email me anytime. And um, my policy is that I'll get back to you within 48 hours, and I'll give you your response with any grades or comments that you want. So yes, hi there everyone, hi Juliana, good to see you. So let's go ahead and continue. If you have ever got questions, comments, anything else, please let me know in the chat and I'll be sure to get, take your comment or question. And as always, 
try to leave some type of comment at some point in the chat just so that I have an informal attendance record for anyone that's here. Okay, great. So let's go back into chapter four, which as you guys maybe remember is all about knowledge and its limits. Okay, so to start things off on this topic of knowledge and the limits of knowledge, we just started with what is the definition of knowledge itself. And they say that knowledge is a definition which includes three main criteria. So just to get our uh, review of last lecture quickly going, who could tell me the main points in the definition of knowledge? They say a knowledge is a blank, blank, blank. There's three main ingredients or something. Who could tell me what those parts of knowledge are? According to you know the consensus view of epistemologists, what does it take to have knowledge? Just let me know. <clears throat> let's find out. I'm sure you know. It's either in your memory, your notes, or it's in both. So let's go back in time. Okay, when one believes something, and it is true, and there's justification. That's right, guys. Good. So it's justified true belief. In other words, when you think something's true, that's when you believe it. That's not enough for knowledge by itself, because like, you know, I could believe that um, the moon is made of cheese, but I can't know that because this is absolutely not true. So um, on top of believing it, thinking it's true, it actually has to be like a fact. So for you to know something, you have to be correct about your belief. That's why when you say, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln was the first president, and you write that as your answer in a test, you don't get credit for knowing the answer because this is not a correct fact. That's not what happened in reality. So you can't know things that are untrue. You have to have a belief that is correct and true. True means it matches the facts of reality, whatever the statement or belief is. And then justification is the third key ingredient, and that's having reasons or evidence that support your belief. So when you have a belief and it is true, and you have reasons to base that belief on, then you have knowledge. But if any condition is missing or not satisfied, then that does not constitute knowledge. Um, okay, and so from there, I guess we just talked about what are some different viewpoints on where most knowledge comes from. There's the difference between empiricism and rationalism. Those that follow empiricism, empiricists, they would say that most human knowledge comes from the five senses and what we can observe by means of those five senses, whether it's sight, taste, touch, hearing, or smell. Um, and then the other viewpoint is rationalism. Rationalism says most human knowledge doesn't come from the five senses and observation, but instead it comes from just pure abstract ideas and, and reason itself, thinking about mathematics or geometry or, or trigonometry or just pure logic. Um, after that, I guess we talked to you guys about what, it did, what evidence is. Evidence is anything that can prove or disprove a claim, and that's a huge topic in critical thinking, logic, and knowledge, because for you to have knowledge, you have to have justification. Justification basically just is evidence. To construct an argument, you have to have premises, and premises are the reasons or the evidence that, that uh, supports that conclusion. Now, what are some basic good sources of reliable evidence that we usually um, have to use and we kind of sometimes take, take for granted? There is um, direct experience. So that's you observing something with your own five senses. Then there's testimony. That's information received by you from someone else that reports it and relays it to you. So instead of you seeing um, who won the Super Bowl by watching the game or something, someone just texts you and tells you what happened, or you read it in the newspaper or something like that. Um, another source of evidence is memory. That's when you obviously simply just recall to mind previously perceived facts or previously received testimony. And then um, there's inference, which is when you draw conclusions from other related facts towards something else. So like, um, <clears throat> I guess uh, if I left out cookies for Santa and then um, the cookies are gone or something, I might say, hey, here's evidence. I infer that Santa came last night. I didn't see him with my own eyes. Nobody told me, but I'm kind of putting two and two together by looking at this other fact and drawing a conclusion from it. So anyway, inference. Um, and of course, good evidence, when we have it, is confirmed by multiple different sources. On the other hand, if you, if you have evidence sources which conflict, which contradict each other, um, like testimony is not 
conform to what you remember or vice versa, then you have to make decisions and judgments about which of those sources is the more reliable to, to, to trust. Okay, um, after that I guess we just began the discussion of what are some unreliable sources of evidence and ways we can make errors. I talked to you about false memory. False memory is when you think that you can remember something, but actually it didn't happen or it didn't happen in the same way that you remembered it. And we talked, we were closing lecture last time with some fun just comments on the whole Mandela effect phenomenon and other cases in which uh, eyewitness testimony was incorrect or produced a false conviction or something. Okay, so a couple of more unreliable sources of evidence while we continue on this same theme. <clears throat> Two unreliable sources of evidence. Okay, so these are stated as unreliable sources. They're sometimes all you have to go on, and if that's the case, it's probably better than nothing, but if you had to choose, you'd prefer to go with a stronger kind of source. And so what are these two? For one, we have uh, hearsay, and then there's also anecdotal or anecdote evidence. So first of all, hearsay evidence. Hearsay is testimony that you receive, but the problem is it's not coming from a first-hand witness to the events. So it passes through a number of different individuals before you receive it. So it's like a chain of testimony from one to another. He said, she said, they said, and then finally they told So when you're like the last in the link of transmission of information, you should have a little bit of skepticism about the quality and the accuracy of the information that you've got by hearsay. So this is um, testimony that passes through several other people before it reaches you. Okay, hearsay. With hearsay, um, think of how sometimes gossip and rumors can um, kind of go beyond the truth. So like maybe someone was at a social event and they saw a person who they know is in a relationship with someone else just talking to somebody and they just kind of gossip amongst themselves. Do you think that he likes that person or whatever that he's talking to? Is he trying to cheat on his partner? And um, what starts off as just a casual observation of a social com conversation between the two people then gets passed to someone else. This other person embellishes the facts like, oh, I heard that so-and-so was making out with that person. And then that goes to another person like, did you hear that he went to that party and he decided he was going to hook up with someone he didn't even like his girlfriend? And then finally, you know, as it goes around and around, finally maybe someone who's a friend of this person that, you know, he's in a relationship with passes on this information. Now. I'm not going to say that you know rumors and gossip can never contain truth, but the thing is you have a, a fair mind to have some skepticism about it because um, even when people are not trying to distort the facts or to deceive anybody, it's hard to, lose, it's hard to keep control of all the details of a piece of information as it passes from one person to another because we just somewhat naturally um, eliminate details or add them according to what we think is most memorable or salient. And sometimes that gets away from the objective truth. Um, there's a game. Maybe some of you have ever heard of this game. If you have, let me know in the chat that you can tell me you've heard about it. But the telephone game, anyone has heard about that? This is a game that is sometimes you know, given in classroom settings to try and inform people about how you, know, you have to be very careful about the quality and accuracy of information that's come through many other people before it reaches you. So the telephone game starts where you have a little script that's whispered into the ear of one person, let's say, on the far end of a classroom size of people. And you just tell them this little piece of information and you say, okay, what you have to do is pass that information to the person behind you without changing any of it or you know, altering the basic um, information. And um, even in a modest sized classroom of like 20 or so people, even a very basic script gets radically changed before it gets to the end. And I've done this in a lot of class settings, you know, when we used to have face-to-face -face meetings. Obviously, we can't do it now through this kind of live chat. But um, 
in such a case, you can give someone a story, which is like, you know, Johnny used to play soccer. One day he um, got a spider bite on his leg and it caused his leg to swell up. So he had to take three months off of soccer. But when he came back, he was never as good again. So that's the end. And like just that little simple story before it goes through 20 people, by the time the last person says what their version of it is, it's like Johnny played soccer and got hurt and it's just, or, or something even less accurate to the original fact. So um, in real life, sometimes you are on the tail end of the transmission of testimony through a whole bunch of people. And that's why you have to double check that kind of statement and treat it with some skepticism. It's not always reliable. Um, and that's not necessarily because anybody's trying to trick anyone or fool them, but just because it's hard to keep control and uh, focus of all little details and facts without it either embellishing them or eliminating some of them when we take information from one party to another. Um, so another unreliable source of evidence is anecdotal evidence. Now what that is, is it's evidence, but it's based on just one person's um, personal experience. So. one person's personal experience. Okay, so anecdote is like a person's own story or recollection of an event and giving that as their evidence for something. With anecdote, it could be either your own experience or the experience of someone else that is cited as the anecdote that provides the evidence. But the problem with anecdotal evidence is that oftentimes it's not fully representative of the general case. Many times a person's individual experience is not reflective or representative of what would ordinarily happen. And that's why anecdotal evidence is often not to be relied on because it's skewed or biased or um, only relevant to the one individual's experience. So like for example, suppose that, uh, you know, Someone, someone smokes and they have a friend that cares about them and says, you know, I know you like to smoke and everything, but really you should probably let it go and just try to quit because it's not good for you. It's going to mess up your health later. And I know that, you know, you want to have a long life. So the person says, you know what? Don't tell me about stopping smoking. Everyone says it's so bad, so bad. But here, my grandpa, you know, he was a heavy smoker his whole life. And, you know, he still smokes to this day, like a cigarette, a pack a day, whatever. And um, he's going strong, you know, he's like, uh, like a bull. This guy's one of the strongest, healthiest people I know. So don't tell me the cigarettes are so bad. You know, look at my grandpa and don't then tell me that. The problem here is you're just referring to one person's personal experience. And you know, there's always those atypical cases, you know, someone who's a deviation from the norm, who maybe has a better health outcome doing something unhealthy than would generally be the case. If you really look at statistical tables though, and you compare the longevity of people who smoke habitually to those that have never smoked, you see that it is a clear difference in what you should expect as an average result. So just cherry picking one example by itself and saying, well, here's someone that didn't seem to have that kind of negative experience. That's not gonna give you good evidence to claim that smoking is not dangerous. Um, you know, and there's a lot of people who think this way and it's just kind of unfortunate because they're misinformed and in some cases they're doing things that are actually dangerous. What if somebody is being told that, you know, COVID is deadly, you don't want to get this disease, you don't want to pass it to your family. And they're like, come on, I know I had a friend, they didn't even have any symptoms. You know, they, they didn't even miss work. They got diagnosed with it. Basically, they just stayed at home, watched movies for a few days, and then they were back and then there's no problem. So, you know, why is COVID such a big deal? Well, anyway, again, it's an anecdote. You know, the, the symptomatic way that it expresses itself in a person who's sick is different from person to person. So you can't just go off of one person's personal experience and then generalize to all those other cases. So if this is the best evidence that you have, just a random anecdote, either your own or someone else's, or just hearsay that has come to you but it's passed through a lot of other people first, it's not necessarily the best high quality evidence that you could have. Now in a court of law, sometimes they say that hearsay is admissible, but only as one piece of evidence in the broader framework of the presentation of arguments and evidence in court. So I don't think hearsay would usually win the case by itself unless it could be somehow further corroborated by other available evidence. So anyway, um, just a side note on whether it's ever admissible to use either kind of evidence in court. Okay guys, so hopefully that makes decent sense to you. I don't know, let me look at the book if there's anything else I could add to it.
<clears throat> okay, so it says here about hearsay. We should be skeptical of what people say, especially if it's hearsay. Hearsay evidence is heard by one person and then repeated to another and so on until you hear it, and it's notoriously unreliable. As children, we probably played the game of telephone, in which we whisper something to one person, and she whispers to the next person, and so on down the line until the last person says what they heard. And it's almost always way different, often amusingly so, from the original evidence, or sorry, message. Anecdotal evidence is based on personal testimonies, also unreliable because of the problem of inaccurate memory as well as the human tendency to exaggerate or distort what we saw or experienced to fit our expectations. Um, so anecdotal evidence is also unreliable for those reasons. Okay, so we go on. Uh, what's a good way of finding some evidence on a topic when you want to deal with someone who knows a lot about it? Well, you can always interview an expert. Um, so experts are a, a good source of information, expert testimony. If expert testimony contradicts an anecdotal piece of evidence, then you should go with the expert or professional consensus. Um, you know, so like if the CDC says that it is not safe for people uh, to go around with no mask if they haven't been vaccinated, um, and someone else says, don't tell me that, I never wear a mask and I'm, I've never had any illness, you should go with the expert's testimony uh, based on real research and evidence instead of the anecdotal report. Um, but even with experts, okay, not all experts are created equal, and sometimes experts can disagree with each other. I remember under the Trump administration that we just ended, um, you know, he had his Dr. Atlas, one of his advisors, a guy from Stanford who was trying to go against like the consensus views of our scientific agencies, and this person, you know, is a doctor of a kind, and so therefore he could present himself as an expert. So when you have different experts that don't agree or that say opposite or conflicting things, how are you to make a relative judgment about which one has the greater credibility? Well, here we go. Here are four things to consider about experts, and these factors will help you to gauge the credibility of the, relative, of the individual expert we're talking about. So four factors to consider about so-called experts. <clears throat> Okay, so for one, take measure of the person's education. By this we mean how much education and at what level and where. So um, obviously a person with a um, bachelor's degree in a topic, which is their major, is going to have a greater degree of educational experience and background on that subject than the person that's not a degree holder. And if we go even further, a person with a master's degree or a PhD um, is going to have even additional level of expertise and knowledge because of that more extensive education. So one thing is the level of education. To what level did the person attain? High school diploma, associate's degree, college degree, bachelor's, master's, PhD, um, MD, or whatever. And uh, also the nature of the institution, because not every institution that confers degrees has equal credibility or, um, or respect, you know, because there's like a lot of online institutions that, well, I mean, everything's online right now, but I mean, that don't even have brick and mortar campuses, uh, which are not fully accredited. And in some of those cases, they can pass on a degree to a person which does not hold the same kind of professional um, esteem, or um, it's not as competitive in the marketplace as a degree from a more time-honored institution. So keep in mind not just the level of education, but the nature of the school or institution that conferred it, okay? Education, the more the better and the more credibility that comes with more education. Another factor to consider beyond just education is experience, which is distinct because a person can have an extremely impressive education, but they don't yet have any professional experience in the field. Like suppose a recent graduate from like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton, one of the Ivy Leagues, you know, with the most stellar academic resume, but they haven't yet put it to work in the field or in the academy. So how much experience does the person have working with this education that they have attained? Are they, you know, a veteran in the field that's been around for a long time? Uh, or are they someone that's fresh out of school? The level of experience is another uh, important factor to use in gauging the credibility of the expert. So education, experience. Then there's reputation. Reputation. So um, sometimes you have people from elite institutions with a lot of experience, but the problem in some cases is their, their reputation is not good. Um, 
You know, there are some people who are outside of the mainstream of the academic, scientific, or other field that they work in, and they espouse views that are not widely held within that field. So if you have this kind of outlier figure, you know, like the, the meteorologist or the, the climate scientist who says, I'm a skeptic about climate change, you know, like the 1% of people that work in that field, this person's views may be relegated to the sidelines, marginal, not taken seriously by other um, professional colleagues and so forth within the same domain. So you have to take measure of the person's reputation too. Sometimes a person who just has the title doctor, professor, officer, you automatically confer respect on them without considering, you know, is there any background information that I could discover about this person's reputation in the field by their other peers? Okay, so reputation matters. And then one more thing are accomplishments. Accomplishments are like, this is the question, does this person have any awards, titles, honors, or publications that give further testament to their credibility in the field? Um, so if they have those things, they've got a long publication record and maybe some academic awards that they've acquired along the way, that adds more credibility, credence to the things that they're saying. So when you have two experts, you might have to sometimes weigh them against each other if they don't agree by comparing how they measure up along these different metrics. So maybe a tie-breaking factor when one you know, medical professional says, I've done a research study which shows that um, limited amount of wine is good for your cardiovascular health. And another research, come, another study comes forward from another institution and that group says, no, our methodology and experiment has shown the opposite, that it's actually not to your benefit to drink any alcohol. And I have two different conclusions from two, let's say, respected professionals or experts. And in order for you to make a relative determination, who's the one that has the more credible view, you might have to then engage in a bit of judgment along these lines and that could be the tie-breaking factor. Okay, sometimes experts do disagree. And when they do, uh, it's kind of frustrating. Sometimes you have to reserve judgment and seek further evidence. Um, does milk help maintain strong bones? I've seen uh, scientific research that shows both yes and no. So depending on which study you think is the more credible, the answer is ambiguous. Um, and is, is caffeine or caffeinated drinks good or bad for you? Some have said that there's some research indicating yes and others saying no. So in some cases anyway, there's not a uniform distribution of opinion across a professional field or in the sciences. Um, okay, so let's see if we can think of some, um, let's see what I wanna go into next. Let me just say this about evaluating evidence. Um, try to find the best evidence possible whenever you seek justification for a claim or for a belief that you have. The credibility of evidence is higher if it's confirmed by multiple other sources of evidence too. So, you know, if testimony, experience, memory, all kind of converge on one proposition or hypothesis, then that's the likelier to be true. Don't allow confirmation bias to allow you to accept a lower standard of proof. See, that's a big problem. Sometimes people are already committed to a given view and so they will take any evidence which seems to verify it as, as indisputable. Um, but have high standards of justification and proof, even for those views that you are favorable towards. Don't make it so easy for the, for the justification to be uh, secure. You know, give yourself a challenge and make sure that the justification that you do have is not weak or merely um, rigged around the preferred position that you want to hold. Um, okay, we hate being wrong, we hate reversing our original positions or changing our mind a lot of times, but being a critical thinker means seeking the truth, not necessarily protecting um, the stability of your already established beliefs. In fact, I always think that's funny, you know, people are like, I can't have my mind changed, as if that's a virtuous thing. Changing your mind is good, because if you never change your mind, then you're going to have to hold on to the views you had as a child throughout your whole life. But when you form those views as a child, you're not yet fully mature or wise. So wouldn't you rather have your views open and evolving throughout the course of your life instead of saying, I need to just preserve the integrity of what I thought when I was 12 years old because if that ever changes, I'll be a different person. Well, you have to grow and change and you shouldn't be um, so attached to the earliest conclusions that you reached when you were not yet fully mature or wise. And that's not just about you, it's me and it's everybody. That's just the human condition. We grow, we experience, and we become a little bit more careful in the way we judge things. 
So we should be able to trust not just the judgments that we had in the past, but the ones that we will have today and in the future, okay? So um, next up, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what are some different uh, resources that you can go to when you're trying to do research, when you're trying to find evidence and information on any topic. What are some good, reliable um, resources to refer to in seeking information? So this is labeled in the textbook as research resources. As a student, you're bound to have some research that you're going to have to do in school. And then just as an everyday citizen or a human being, sometimes you want to do research just for your own knowledge. There's something you don't know about, and you go out and you say, I need to learn about that and what it is. So whether it's for academic, professional, business, or just personal reasons, research is a big part of being a critical thinker and a human being. So what are some good places and sources to use in terms of research? The textbook just lists a quick little grab bag of some of these resources. So one could be um, the actual library. Now, I mean, we're all kind of, you know, this book and the version that we're using, some of the information predates the uh, onset of the pandemic, obviously. And so I don't know what the case is right now about going to the physical library. Are they closed? Are they non-essential? Are they essential? Well, let's suppose that we return to like full face-to-face -face interactions in the future, um, in the not too distant future, which I think is actually gonna happen. You know, this max, mass vaccination campaign that's being rolled out, according to what I've read, every American will have the option to be vaccinated by the end of May. And so after that, if you're not vaccinated, it won't be because there's no supply, because there'll be more supply than demand at that point, It'll be because people just chose not to. So I think we'll actually be able to return to a lot of our everyday uh, ways of life soon, but I digress. The library. The library is a great place to study and to find information. There's all kinds of books, periodicals, not just in the one library, but you can request them um, from the interlibrary loan system. At Cal State Fullerton, I mean, if you wanted a book that's in one of the other Cal State libraries, you could request it and have it shipped over there so that you can view it and use it. Um, so libraries are there for the public. You know, there's free books, free information for any of us to use and um, and research topics. They're also nice, quiet places to study, at least they used to be, um, when we could go into them. So that's one place to look, a good research resource. Another are scholarly journals, academic journals. So no matter what subject you're interested in, it's math, it's philosophy, history, um, physics, there are academic journals devoted to every possible area of study and and little niche area of specialization. So I guarantee if there's something in the field of academic study that you'd like to know more about, you could definitely find a professional academic journal to read about that topic. Um, these academic journals are hard to be published in. I can tell you that because I've published a few articles and the rejection rate is very high. So people submit articles to these journals and then there's a peer review process. You have a referee that looks at the document and Usually there's a lot of rejection, so only the most high quality, you know, cream of the crop papers and so on can pass through this gauntlet of peer review and find their way into a venue like an academic journal. So everything that you read in those journals, journals with, you know, good reputations and stuff, is going to be thoroughly vetted and, um, and uh, cross and double checked for errors, inaccuracies, and poor argument. So yeah, they're always very good and high level high quality academic research material. The only issue I guess is that they're written for uh, fellow specialists in the field. So sometimes they can be quite technical and complex, but if you're willing to take a challenge and um, you know, kind of chew on some of the most uh, high level academic writing, then that's one place to go. And you can request academic journals either um, by subscription online or you know, at school libraries, they're oftentimes housed there too. Okay, there's also government documents. Government documents. So um, all governments and, of course, the United States government have a bunch of agencies that are officially responsible for informing the public about any number of different topics. So if you want to know facts about um, labor and uh, employment numbers, then you might go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, and see what information they have um, on file. If you want to know something about 
uh, the state of the, our climate and our environment, then you might read publicly available papers given out by the Environmental Protection Agency. Or if you want to know about um, criminal justice and uh, incarceration rates, then maybe you'll look at the Department of Justice reports on those matters. So um, as citizens, we do have access to a whole bunch of very interesting publicly available documents. There are also certain uh, classified documents which reach the public through leaks or through declassification. And sometimes you can find those also online um, when that happens. There's a good website for that called scribd.com. Sometimes I'll go there when I'm trying to find recently declassified or leaked government documents. But anyway, just a, just a little reference to Scribd. Okay, so the thing is, I guess, I mean, if you're living in like a, uh, if you're living in a really bad state or government where they deceive people about the facts and the truth, then you would perhaps have a little more skepticism about the quality and the veracity of these government documents. But for the most part, we have career professionals working at these agencies in the United States. And although political influence can sometimes have a negative impact on the quality of these reports, uh, they're for the most part legitimate. Okay, so there's also the internet, okay? And that one, I guess, is almost too obvious. Probably that's the go-to method of research that most all young people and just everyday people use. If you want to find something out, you know, there's always Google search engine and you can go down the rabbit hole and find information that way. But with the internet, there's also a lot of false information and um, sensationalized claims and in a lot of cases, conspiracy theories. So you do have to kind of navigate the world of the online with, uh, with knowledge that not everything written there is true. Um, you know, like for example, a, a professional mainstream journalist or journalistic institution can have a website that is just as professional looking as some blogger who just, you know, spends time designing a cool looking website. But that doesn't mean that they're equally um, credible in terms of how much thought and um, methodology goes into the way that they find facts and present them. So be aware of the things that you read sometimes online, double check against other available sources, because there's a lot of people with opinions out there that are not referring to evidence when they make claims. And so make sure you're sensitive to that. Um, there's also interviewing the expert. So if you have access to an expert in a given topic, then one good way to do research is simply to have a little chat and an interview on that topic with an expert in the field. And since you guys are college students, you do have access to a whole bunch of experts or different professors who are at least experts on the topic that they specialize in in, in um, the university. So take clear notes. Um, maybe you can record if they allow you to do that. Pick the brain of the experts out there and get the most productive information from them. Okay, so just a few places to go as you're trying to find facts, information, justification for the various claims that we end up believing in life. So to, to the next point, <clears throat> the textbook refers to, this is a little weird, but it uses an acronym called the CRAAP test, okay, C-R-A-A-P. This is just to make it a memorable acronym, but the letters each stand for a different word, and each of those words is a point of evaluation about how you could judge a piece of evidence. Okay, so this is like a five-point uh, criteria for judging the quality of a piece of evidence that you've gotten from whatever of those different sources. So here is a so-called crack test. Again, it's just an acronym, meaning that each letter stands for a word, and that will refer us to five different ways of judging the credibility of a piece of information. So C, letter C in this word, stands for currency. Currency, now, we don't mean like dollar bills, currency, that kind of thing. Instead, we mean in the sense of current, like how recent is this information that you're using as evidence? Is it up to date? Is it new? Or is it old and outdated? So usually, the more recent and current the data is, the better it is for the purposes of justification. Um, sometimes on social media and stuff, I will see people making arguments and they then like link to an article, but the article has to do with something that's way in the past and therefore these facts maybe no longer exist or they're no longer relevant to the current day situation. 
Like say that a person said to you, oh look, climate change, everyone talks about it, but is it real? Look at this article from 1915. It shows that weather had basically remained unchanged from 1850 to 1915. So how can you say there's global warming? Well, the problem is if they're looking at something that is that old and historical, then it can't possibly have any information about the spike of global temperature that all has happened since the 21st century. So that would be outdated information and it wouldn't be current enough to justify the claim that there's no such thing as global warming. Um, so, you know, how recent it is matters. And usually, unless you're actually studying like a, a historical issue in the past where current data doesn't relate to it, then you want it to be more up to date rather than less. Okay, so that's currency, the letter C. R is for relevance. Obviously, the uh, information has to be relevant to the topic that you're trying to research. So if you're studying climate change and you're looking at like divorce rates across the 20th century and you're like, hmm, it looks like the divorce rate steadily increased. So now it's almost like 50% of marriages end in divorce. And over that same time period, there's been an increase in global temperature. Are these two things related? Maybe people getting divorced is causing the temperatures to rise around the planet. Well, this is obviously an irrelevant piece of information that doesn't have any bearing on the real topic. Um, a social fact about whether people are making up or breaking up is not by itself determinative of the accumulation of greenhouse gases or global temperatures one way or the other. So it's information, but it doesn't relate to the topic of interest, and therefore it would be bad evidence to use in building a case. Now, there's two letters, A. One of them, the first, let's say, stands for authority. What that means is, who provided this information, and what authority does the person have to speak on the topic? Is it an expert in the field with a lot of education and knowledge about it, or is it just a random person with a you know a strong opinion about it, but they're just a blogger or something, and so they really don't know? You know, like um, you can imagine a person who defends um, less restrictive immigration policies, like they're an opponent of the border wall, and like say that that's a person who's actually worked in um, immigration courts and in the court system trying to um, negotiate for the rights of people who are trying to seek asylum and stuff. And another person has just got a really powerful overbearing opinion, but they have no experience in the field. You might say that one person actually talks with experts who deal with the situation on the ground, and when you read what they've written, it has that additional degree of credibility that comes from the experience. Another person with a powerful opinion and a website might not have any kind of authoritative knowledge or expertise to base their views on. So you want to take measure of who gives the, the information or evidence and what authority do they have to speak on it. Okay, the second letter A for accuracy. That's fundamental. It almost goes without saying, but we're going to say it anyway. It's, is the information true, factual, credible, or is it supposed to be satirical, humorous, um, is it just written to create controversy or something or to troll people, as they say? So um, you want to obviously fact check the information, see what Snopes has said about it, um, double cross check it against fact checkers and those that have studied these claims themselves, okay? And finally, the last letter is P, which stands for purpose. And this point of evaluation means what is the reason that the information was created? What's the purpose that this information was created in the first place? Was it created simply to inform people about the facts? Or was it created to sell a product? Or was it created to advance some kind of ideological agenda that the person is favorable towards? You know, like, um, for example, I know people, sometimes even close people, I don't want to name them, but, you know, people in my life that I care a lot about, sometimes I find are just making poor decisions about their own health and fitness. So like, you know, I have one guy I know who he'll follow all these different diet trends, you know, like the newest whatever diet trend he wants to jump on and see how it helps his health or something. Um, but a lot of times when he looks at the evidence behind the claim being made, like who, pro who promotes this diet plan? It'll be someone with a YouTube channel. And then if you look carefully enough, you'll see that they're actually selling a book or they're selling a diet plan which goes together with their message. So is it really the fact that this is the healthiest way to eat, like only eating potatoes or like, you know, eating just pure meat all the time with no vegetables, like all kinds of extreme diets out there exist. And they're preying on people in this wellness community who don't, let's say, research the science 
to double check these claims. So knowing that someone's trying to sell a product and that's what they're using to hawk this argument uh, would give you a healthy dose of skepticism about what the person's really saying. So you know, keep in mind what's the motive for the person to have provided this information. And if they have a neutral or unbiased motive, then that would help add credibility to what's been said or claimed in that case. Okay, so we talked about research resources. We talked about the little crap test, which is when you're looking at a piece of information, consider its credibility by weighing it against these five criteria. Okay, so the next thing from the book to kind of add a few more points and then wrap up chapter four is it talks about cognitive and perceptual errors. So cognitive and perceptual errors, those are errors in the processing of information. Um, a cognitive error is an error in thinking and judgment. And a perceptual error is an error actually in the way that you even perceive something with your senses. So let me get into it, but before I do, I wanna mention a little anecdote that the textbook goes over, which is the War of the Worlds broadcast. Okay, so <clears throat> the War of the Worlds broadcast is an interesting episode in American history. This was a radio broadcast that happened October the uh, 30th of 1938. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, have any of you ever heard about this event, the War of the Worlds broadcast, what happened and why we still talk about it sometimes? Let me know, does anyone know about it? If so, let's hear about just whether you've heard about it in the chat. War of the Worlds, anybody? Let me know. Hmm. Sounds familiar? Okay, Danny. Um, <clears throat> let me refresh those memories if anyone doesn't remember. So basically, here's the thing. The year is 1938. Television doesn't yet exist. Oh, Diane, so I think people were listening to something else and then switched stations and took the War of the Worlds thing for real news. Basically, correct. That's basically it. So just let me add the little details. In the year 1938, there's no televisions yet. That's about a decade away before televisions, even the 50s, is it's a little more than a decade away. So um, at that time, if you wanted to receive news reports, um, entertainment, the equivalent of like our electronic or digital media, you would only have the radio. And so the radio was a staple of the American household. That would be where you know families would gather around um, at the evening and listen to the radio, which would broadcast in some case um, color commentary for live sports, in other cases, news and weather. And then sometimes um, there would be entertainment broadcasts. So it would be like a, a audio enactment of like a script of a movie or novel. Okay, so instead of obviously visual cameras and actors, you know, acting it out visually, you just have voice actors reading lines, okay? So there was one night, October 30th, 1938, a broadcast on the radio, and it was of a reenactment of a novel by Orson Welles called The War of the Worlds. Now, that's a science fiction novel, and the plot line is that basically Martians from, from Mars come down, invade the planet Earth, and start attacking us. Um, and our people. So that's the plot of the novel. And it was simply being acted out on the radio, you know. But, um, you know, there's like a disclaimer where they would say, this is not real, this is fiction. But some people tuning in a little late didn't notice that, and they misinterpreted that this was a news broadcast of real news. So basically some people became so panicked because they thought that there was a radio announcer saying, the Martians are here, the Martians, they've invaded, the flying saucers, they're attacking. And because of that, some people got in such a panic that they even had distorted perception. Like when they looked out on the distant horizon, they're like, wait, I think I see it. There's one of them. That's actually a flying saucer. Who knows what they're really seeing? It's just like a little item in the sky, um, you know, but a glint of light, you know, seen through a glass or whatever. But people were actually having such um, heightened sense.
Oh, we're back? Okay, we are back. Thank you guys. Just a very slight intermittent outage by my Wi-Fi router, but I think we are back now. I see some of the students may have left the meeting for the moment, but hopefully they will find their way back. I was just about to start another stream using mobile data. Sometimes that happens. It's very rare, but um, it's just something to laugh off and not take too seriously. In this internet age that we are in, obviously sometimes it's hard for the connection to always be strong. But anyway, I was waiting. I didn't lecture on. I could tell that it froze for a minute. And so I just paused as I was finishing the description of the War of the Worlds. I don't know if you had audio or if there was no audio or video during that time, but I was able to use the chat and just let you know that I'm still here. So if you guys have like a Discord or group chat or something like that where you have connection to other students in the same class, let them know that the stream is still going and that it was just a temporary outage. So hopefully they'll be able to find their way back to the meeting. I see that there's 22 here. But in a way, it's a good thing to go through this once. So just so you guys know, if ever there is an outage like that, I'm, I'm never going to abandon the stream. I'm never going to just like go away and not let you know. Um, I'll always reconstitute the stream, either by turning on mobile data and going to 5G, or, um, or just waiting for it to clear up, which it seems to have done in this case. So OK, I see people arriving back. And I'm just going to continue through the notes um, where we left off, OK? Nothing's been lost. The stream continues. Thank you guys for your patience. Sorry for the little delay. OK, so what are some common cognitive and perceptual errors that we can make with our minds as we process information? The World of the World broadcast, the only real takeaway there is that our social influences can shape the way we perceive things. So because people believe that this was a message coming to them through the radio from an authoritative source, they were inclined to trust it without further consideration, and that actually caused some people to be in a deep panic. I've even heard some people may have committed suicide during that time period, but I'm not so sure whether I can verify that or if that's just sort of a embellishment of the original facts, but someday maybe you'll find out and look it up. Okay, so cognitive and perceptual errors. <clears throat> So any number, any one of us can make cognitive or perceptual errors in thinking and in processing information. But knowing what those errors are and therefore being able to monitor yourself for them will help you to prevent committing them at least sometimes. So what are some of these cognitive and perceptual errors? One of them mentioned in the book is misperception of random data. Misperception of random data. So um, this happens when um, we see order or a pattern in something which is in fact just random. Okay, so Okay, so when you appear to see or perceive order or structure or a pattern in something when it's actually just random and disordered. So the mind hates an absence of meaning or structure, and so sometimes the mind will actually impose order or a pattern on something where in fact there is none in and of itself. Um, think of easy examples of like when a person looks up at the clouds, if they have a very creative imagination, they might say, oh, that cloud, it looks just like an elephant, or that cloud, it looks just like a submarine. And um, Obviously, the cloud itself is not something that has been intentionally created by an artist to mirror or reflect any object. It's just an accumulation of, you know, um, of water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. So in that case, it's essentially random, but one is seeing an order or a pattern. Maybe that's harmless enough, but, um, you know, other examples, someone thinks they can see a face of a man in the moon. Obviously, that's just the discoloration created by the uh, pattern of, uh, crater impacts on the moon's surface. Um, sometimes people will say, look, there was a hurricane, and if you look closely at the hurricane from satellite image above, it looks like an evil or satanic face. Does this mean that we're being punished by God for having done something? He visits this hurricane upon us. Well, again, 
um, something as random as the array of clouds that form in the atmosphere from the view of a satellite cannot possibly be characterized or thought of as something that has design, pattern, or order. Sometimes stress or fear can influence this tendency. Um, so like sometimes maybe if you watch a really scary movie and you kind of feel a little jumpy and anxious because of how scary it was, if you're walking around late at night and it's dark, you know, you might like kind of walk a little more quickly to your car or something as you see like a tree branch blowing off to your left. And at that point in time, your brain is set to interpret almost anything as like an imposing or scary figure. Sort of like how little children are sometimes having a hard time falling asleep at night in their room because they'll see shadows cast about the wall as like, you know, sinister lurching figures and so forth. Um, sometimes we have a tendency to see things that are just not there because of the brain looking for order. Um, maybe you've ever heard of a person who said they saw like the image of a divine figure in a discolored piece of toast or um, a tree branch that had some kind of damage to it. Once again, um, this would be misperception of random data. So know that, know that that's something that we can do. The textbook talks about how to sort of use it as a life hack to your benefit. Um, you can control your appetite sometimes through the use of portion size. So uh, that's kind of a perceptual error where the perception of normal portion size affects the appetite. They studied this in animals. So like if you give a chicken 50 grains of feed, um, it will eat it and be satisfied. But if you give it 100 grains of feed, it will eat that and be satisfied. So it actually triggers the mechanism of physiologically feeling full, depending on what you leave as a full portion. So if you have smaller portions, you can trick your brain into feeling full and less food. Um, okay, so that's one of the cognitive or perceptual errors, misperception of random data. Next up, there's memorable events error. <coughs> Okay, so the brain, the mind, it more easily remembers events that are unusual or uncommon, okay? So like if I ask you, um, what were you doing on your birthday last time? I'm sure that because your birthday is a special enough day, you have clear enough memories. But if I just ask you like a random date on the calendar, assuming this is not your birthday, what were you doing on June 6th last year? You know, unless you had some special event happening then, you might probably have to go back in your like photo reels or on your social media accounts to see what you even were doing then. Because just a random day with no kind of ultimate meaning or significance to you. So the mind more easily remembers things that are unusual, that stand out from uh, the background of other things. And that can lead to a perceptual or cognitive error called memorable events error. So this is when you place more importance on things than, de than is deserved just because they are uncommon. Okay, so... When you place more uh, importance on an event than it deserves, just because it was uncommon. Uncommon, unusual, out of the ordinary. An example of this is in the book, they talk about the difference between how we think of plane crashes versus automobile accidents. Okay, so one of those two things is more unusual or less common than the other. And I, obviously it's a plane crash. A plane crash is relatively rare. Um, in fact, I think we've had some of the best years in aviation history over the past few years in the United States in terms of minimal number of accidents and fatalities on airplanes. So um, when a plane crash happens, it's highly unusual and it, it's a big deal and everyone pays a lot of attention to it in the news. But a car accident, that's something that if you drive at all, or even if you don't, you probably see those on the regular. Like, I mean, when I would commute to drive to and from campus, you know, um, I would see a car accident on the freeway on the 405 or the 5 or 57. Geez, that one's a tough freeway uh, almost every day. Uh, you know, people disabled on the side. Sometimes the car crash is even worse than that. You know, the car could be on fire. I've seen a total loss on the car, you know, it's totally smashed. So car crashes are common. Airplane accidents are not. So because the airplane accident is less common, we attach more importance to it than it really deserves. And because the auto accidents are just seen every day, we become numb to them, we get used to them, and we just take them for granted. So let me ask you this. Though the car accident is much more common, and it's statistically 
you maybe heard this said before, you're way likelier to die in the car on the way to the airport, like in a car accident, than you are to die in the airplane traveling from point A to point B. Just if you took it as like the numerator, the number of dead people on that form of transportation, and the denominator, the number of people that use that form of transportation. It's a very, very high uh, level of survival on planes when you compare them to cars. So if you're actually proportioning your fear and anxiety about being hurt to the thing that is more threatening, then you would be more afraid of driving than flying. But most people have it the opposite way around, and there's the memorable events error. Because the plane crash is so rare and unusual, we place more importance on it than it really deserves, and therefore we become more scared of the thing that's actually less dangerous. Okay. Um, another example I can think of maybe is take mass shootings that happen from domestic attackers, you know, people that are mentally ill or just bent on some weird ideology and they go to a public place or a school or something, house of worship, and they just shoot a bunch of people and kill them. That unfortunately happens too often. It's happened a little less since we've all been on lockdown. So I guess that's one sort of silver lining if you want, even though it's well overcompensated for by all the dead people from COVID. But anyway, um, that happens too much. And before the pandemic, we were having an epidemic of school shootings happening almost every couple of months. So <clears throat> that's something that we pay attention to, but it happens so much that we almost became numb to it. And that's kind of sad too, like school shootings and mass shootings becoming so normal that people just kind of don't pay attention to them. But a domestic international, sorry, an international terrorist organization where an attack is laid against Americans, that's very rare. That's uncommon, like a 9-11 type attack or um, I don't know, uh, some other international terrorist organization which wages a successful attack. That's very rare. In fact, if you look again statistics, you're much likelier to be shot by like some crazy person with a high-powered weapon who's an American than you are to be killed by an international terrorist, just if we looked at the raw numbers. So there again, one thing is more likely to hurt you than the other, but people seem to be much more afraid of the domestic, sorry, the international terrorists than the domestic um, attackers. We're willing to change our laws, customs, um, civil liberties eroded to, pre to prevent the, the, the less dangerous thing that's less likely to happen. Sky, you say, because plane crash makes you hopeless from any survivability from that crash. Yes, well, if we just consider, given that one has been in such an accident, how likely are they to, how likely is it to be fatal? Yes, plane accidents are much more lethal than car accidents are just because, you know, you're up in the air and you're coming down. Um, but they happen so much less often. And even in some cases where there are crashes, as we saw recently where a plane, the parts were actually falling off, it was still able to somehow successfully make an emergency landing. So if we're just talking about fatal outcomes from the mode of transport itself, even when we account for um, the numbers and we make it like a proportion of total passengers, it's still safer to fly. Okay, guys, so memorable events error. And let me end that discussion with something from the book on the same point. Um, Memorable events error involves the ability to vividly remember outstanding events. Scientists have discovered channels in the brain that actually hinder most long-term memories by screening out the mundane incidents in our everyday life. I mean, in a way that makes sense for the brain, right? It would be overwhelming if you had detailed memories of every little random thing that happens. So only the things that stand out kind of get filed in memory and given importance. However, these memory impairing channels appear to close down during outstanding events. For example, most American adults recall exactly where they were on 9-11 if you're alive. However, if you ask someone what they were doing on an ordinary weekday two months ago, most people would not be able to remember or would remember only if they could think of something special that happened on that day. To use another example, airplane crashes and fatalities are reported in the national media, whereas automobile fatalities generally are not. However, per mile traveled, airplane travel is far safer. We are 16 times more likely to be killed in an automobile accident than in an airplane accident. In fact, traffic accidents are one of the leading causes of death. However, the memorable events error exerts such control over our thinking that even after we know these statistics, we still are more nervous about flying than about driving. You know, when someone gets in a plane, you always say to them, if you care about them, call me when you land. But when someone gets out on the highway, you don't say, well, call me when you get there. Just make sure you got to your destination safely. So again, our attitudes in this case are not necessarily rational if we're trying to proportion our concern to the level of danger. Okay, so next up, probability error. <clears throat> Probability error is pretty easy to explain. It's just when you um, you give a wrong estimate of the probability of an event by a significant margin.
When you give a wrong estimate of the probability of an event by a significant margin, then you commit the probability error. There's basically two ways to make this error. One way is overestimating the odds of something, thinking that it's more likely than it actually is. On the other hand, you can underestimate the probability of something. You can think that it is less likely than it really is. So we can have an error of over or underestimation of the odds. Um, now, one example of probability error that's easy to explain is the gambler's fallacy. Okay, so say that a person is gambling. Um, let me give you one kind of example of a gamble. Suppose we're gambling on a coin flip, right? So I have the coin, I'm going to toss it, and I say, let us make a bet. Choose your side. Which side do you choose? So you choose whatever, heads. Now, what is the chance that you're going to win the bet? Easy, right? You guys know this. It's 50% because it's, in, it's a fair coin, and it can only land on one of the two sides. So this is, this, it's just one of two possible outcomes. You've got a 50-50 outcome likely here. <clears throat> Suppose you land, it lands heads. Suppose you flip it again, it lands heads again. Three times, heads the third time. Okay, what's the probability that it's going to land heads the fourth time? Does anybody think they know? Because my scenario given to you is the coin you flipped it three times and it was heads, heads, heads. Now before you do the fourth time, what do you think are the odds of the fourth trial being a heads outcome? That's a question. What do you think? on the fourth sequence, or the fourth uh, coin toss in the sequence, is the probability the same or different? It's the same, that's right, Brenda. It is still 50%, it's not changing from flip to flip. So the previous set of trials has absolutely no bearing on the next one that's coming up. It's not like the coin can take into account that it's already landed heads three times, so now it's tails that is due. Now, of course, there's the law of averages, and so someone might think, well, if it's heads, 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 it can't be heads forever because a coin over time is going to average to about a 50% ratio on either side. But that is confusing the probability of a drawn out sequence with the probability associated with a single trial within the sequence. For each flip individually considered, it is 50-50. But, you know, if we were to flip this coin a thousand times, we would expect it to approach the statistical distribution of 50-50 over the long run. So um, people sometimes commit this error when they're gambling, right? You know, like you say you're at Vegas and you're betting on the roulette table. If you know about roulette, it's basically like there's two colors, red and black, and it's 50-50 essentially. There's two little slots that are green, which that is given to make it so that the house has the greater odds and that in the, in the long run they win. But basically with heads, sorry, with red or black, you've got a pretty good chance to, to, to come home with the, with the win. So... Suppose you're betting and you bet red and the roulette table spins and red comes back and you won. Does that mean that you should double down on red because red is hot? What if it's red, red? Does that mean the third time red is the best choice? It doesn't. It's just random. And so if you're thinking it's more likely because it's already happened a few times, you're overestimating the odds. You think it's less likely because you already had three sequences of red and now black is due or whatever. You're underestimating the probability. The probability can be easily determined by simply taking the numerator as the set of values where the color exists and the denominator, the total number of slots, and then you'll have your exact probability right there. So sometimes probability error can make us a little superstitious even. Like, take this as an example. Um, sometimes you're thinking of a person, and has this ever happened to you? Like right at that moment where you randomly think of a person, they text you or they message you, and you're like, whoa, this is like... This is like supernatural. Like we have a we have like ESP or psychic connection because I was just thinking of them when they texted me. Now, when that happens, why does a person have sometimes a tendency to assign a supernatural paranormal explanation? Because in their mind, they're thinking this is almost impossible. How could it? What are the odds? You know that I would think of them when they texted me. Well, the problem is that they're forgetting all those other times where they think of somebody and no such message comes in. So they're basically not noticing that if you actually look at the full set of cases where you actually think of someone and they don't ever get in touch with you at that same time, that the numerator and the denominator are actually what you would expect. It's like one time of receiving a message in tandem with a thought over a denominator of like a thousand of those cases, but you don't remember all the other ones because they're not memorable, um, so they just get forgotten. So anyway, try to have a correct and an accurate estimation of odds because when you make decisions, you have to make decisions based on probabilities. And if you're deciding based on the wrong estimate of probability, then your actions are not going to be rational. Okay, so that's probability error. <clears throat> 
Now, after that, I guess I wanted to talk to you all about the self-fulfilling prophecy. This is another kind of error in judgment that we can make. So the self-fulfilling prophecy is an error that we commit when we um, expect something to happen. And because we expect it to happen, we end up doing things that actually cause it to happen somehow. In many cases, we do it unknowingly, but our behavior leads to the predicted or prophesied event. So um, when your expectation of an event ends up somehow causing the event to happen, And in that case, you like self-fulfill your own prediction, kind of. Okay, so sometimes we are kind of anxious about a negative result of, of something. And when we think that this undesirable outcome is going to happen, then a lot of times we behave in ways which lead to the outcome happening, even if it's not good for us, right? So like suppose that you are um, taking a class and on day one, when you look at the syllabus and you hear the professor explain the nature of the class, you start to get this sinking feeling and you think, you know what, honestly, I just have a bad feeling about this class. I have a feeling, I, have, I expect that I'm not gonna do well, you know? I really, that's what I'm sort of sensing, that I'm not gonna have a good grade in this class. So suppose the person expects to not do very well. If they don't think they will do very well, then how do you think that might affect their performance in the class? If a person has kind of given up on the possibility of doing well on day one, and that's their expectation, then what kind of things do you think they might do or not do having that expectation? If you think you probably won't pass, then you might not, for example, let me know what in the chat. So see if you can relate to that. Someone's convinced or they, they sense, they feel, they expect that this is not going to be their best result for a class. That's what they think right at the beginning. And having that thought in mind and that expectation in mind, they then proceed to what? Help me out. What do you think they would do from there perhaps? Yeah, you might not try to put in your best effort, right, Dimitri? Because you're thinking, if that's the case, well, why would I try my hardest? If I really think that it's just going to be a failure in the end, then why would I, you know, go the extra mile, attend all the classes, read all the readings, um, do all the assignments with my best level of attention? If I feel like it's not going to be so good, then why am I going to devote a lot of attention to it? But because of that, you're actually taking steps that are going to ultimately lead to the negative result that you don't want. How about in a relationship or in a social situation? You're being invited to an event, and you have this thought, ah, I think it's going to be terrible. I feel like these people aren't going to like me. You know, it's just going to be a bad event. I'm not going to make any friends. So you have that expectation. And then when you go in there, you're not acting friendly because that's what you expect. And because of that, people are like, I don't know if I want to hang out and talk to that person because they seem to be so awkward. Now, because you expected to have an awkward and, you know, antisocial experience at the party, you behave in a way that leads to the expected event happening in a relationship. You think that the partner maybe isn't so into you anymore and you start expecting that maybe they're going to dump you because they don't like you as much as you thought. So if you expect that they're going to dump you, you might start to withdraw from them emotionally. If you think you're going to get dumped, then why are you going to, you know, buy them flowers or give them, shower them with sweet compliments and all of that. But now it looks to them as though you're withdrawing affection and now it's causing them to not like you as much. So it leads to the breakup that you kind of expected, but you caused it to happen through the expectation. Take athletic performance. You're taking the field of competition for whatever sport you play. And you look at the opposing team or opponent and you're like, I just feel like it's not going to happen today. I just feel like we're not going to win. If you don't think you're going to win and you expect to lose, then why would you make the extra effort play? Why would you go as hard as you possibly could if you already think that failure is kind of a given? Then because of that lack of intensity and effort, you don't, you don't win. Now, these are little individual circumstances, but there could also be larger social contexts where this thing happens. Suppose you've got two nations, right, that border each other, and each one is anticipating that the other one might launch nukes or short of that wage war against them launch an attack so because they both expect the other side to attack they start to prepare defensively for the possibility of an attack 
But now the other country sees their defensive preparations and they see that as aggressive and they start preparing as well for the possibility of an attack. So the two sides escalate based on the expectation of mutual hostility and eventually it breaks out into war and now we've got a war, which no one wanted, simply because everyone expected it to happen and then they acted in accordance with the expectation. Or last one, like the Great Depression. If everybody expects the banks to collapse and the stock market to crash, then what they will probably do, because they expect that, is to withdraw all their funds from the stock market and from their bank accounts. But if they do that, then there's no liquidity in the stock market or in the financial sector, and that causes the financial collapse that was <laughs> predicated on the run on the banks that was happening just because everyone thought it would collapse. So anyway, with self-fulfilling prophecy, don't have an overly negative set of expectations that's not based on reason. Wait for things to develop and judge things as the facts dictate. But in many cases, if you go into a situation already equipped with a negative expectation of how things will play out, then that can inevitably lead you to behave in ways that um, cause the undesirable outcome to happen. And I don't know if there's a way of making this a positive thing. In some cases, like you expect to win, so you come prepared to win and you act like you're gonna win and that causes you to win. Maybe that's not such a bad thing, but at least in the negative sense, we should guard ourselves against um, a tendency to harbor overly pessimistic assumptions about how things may go, especially when it's our own behavior that might lead to the fulfillment of that uh, prophecy. So look, there's really just like mm, two more uh, definitions at the very end of chapter four, and I do want to talk about them, but it's not too much material to cover. So I'll send you guys the study guide over the weekend so we can have our review session on Tuesday or Monday, my bad. Uh, but I'm going to also open up on Monday with the last two vocabulary items from chapter four so that we get those in. And just so you know, it's going to be um, the one of us, one of them error and diffusion of responsibility. So those will be two last terms to add to their notes of chapter four. And then we'll be ready to go for the review session and the midterm next week. Okay, guys. So I appreciate all of your hard work and attendance. Um, thanks again. It's pretty much class time. So I'm going to let us go. Just let me know in the chat that everything's good. Sorry for the temporary outage, um, but you know the, the lecture is up on this YouTube channel, so none of the content has been lost, and um, you know that's probably the reason that I couldn't quite get to the last two vocabulary items. But not to worry. Okay, then thanks again, everyone. I'll see you after the weekend. If you need anything by email, let me know. And if you're looking for grades for your earlier assignments, just email me, and I'll let you know. Okay, have a good one then, and I'll see you soon. Bye bye. <clears throat>